Gear Tasting Radio is brought to you by Imminent Threat Solutions. ITS provides knowledge that empowers individuals with indispensable skill sets to explore the world and prevail against all threats. Right now, as a special thank you for all podcast listeners, we're offering 10% off in the ITS store. Simply use the code GTR to save 10% at store.itstactical.com. Welcome to Gear Tasty Radio, where we offer an in-depth look into the usage and philosophy behind the equipment in our lives. I am joined today by Rob Henderson. Hello. And I'm Brian Black. Today, we are going to go over a question that came in yep. that we want to field and answer, and I think it'd be a good topic. So, take so it away. Mark emailed in and said, I'm a big fan of Ridiculous Dialogue and the Gear Tasting Podcast. Thank you. I appreciate the episode Intel Post, but was wondering if it was possible to get a standalone list of all the books you talk about. I'm working to be a better person, and gear tasting is actually very motivational. Part of my goal is to start reading books again. So, yeah, I would yeah. love to make some recommendations on books. We could do it here on the podcast, and we'll also put together a pretty good list, too. Yeah. We have something going on the site we've had for a while. It's now down in the footer of the website, but there's a link called Books, and we've listed some books down there. It's not comprehensive and you know, I'll admit that we haven't updated it in a while, but I think it's a good start. Uh, yeah, it is a it is a good reference library for a lot of good books on different skill set topics and things like that that we talk about. Um, I want to start with just kind of going over what we're both reading right now. Yeah, um, and then we can kind of get into recommendations as well. So, what are you reading currently? So, I am going back through a book called Class Eleven. Uh, and it was it's a book that was written by a, uh, a CIA team, gu- team guy book. No, it was a CIA. Oh, CIA class. It, it was okay. the first CIA class after 9/11. Oh, and so I'm reading through that. It's kind of interesting because he talks about he doesn't really go into the training they get necessarily, but mm-hmm. he highlights a lot of the stuff that they do in their process. And it's just an interesting look into life as a CIA, um, like a station chief. Okay. Sta- so not like a deep cover operative or anything, but they still do clandestine type stuff. I was just talking to Nick the other day about that book he's working on, and he's mm-hmm. in the the early throes of getting it into the review process for nice. the government. You know, the Pentagon has to review every oh, yeah. single book that comes across their desk. And yep. I've heard that he was saying that he mentioned that the wait times are getting ridiculous on, on that. And Everybody's writing. Yeah, yeah. Lots of people are writing books, which, I mean, there's pros and cons of both of those, and you can look at it either which way and... You know, whether your opinion is that people shouldn't write books or should. Um, I first read about, I guess what really got me to want to go to Bud's was reading Rogue Warrior by Richard Marcinko. Mm -hmm. That's a great book. And it was kind of funny how I picked that up, too. So my family was in Virginia Beach for a vacation uh, because my grandparents lived in Fairfax, Virginia, and we drove to the beach one summer. And this Mm -hmm. is probably 11, 12, something like that. And I was into gear, surprise, surprise, back then. <laughs> so I would, every time we'd go somewhere new, I would get out the yellow pages and I would look up Army Navy stores oh, that's in a, the area. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's how into gear I was. And then we, I found one out of the yellow pages and we went there and I looked around and I saw that book there. And nice. I remember being too young to afford it, obviously, but I wanted to read the book, which is weird for that age. But I, you know, I saw it, I read the cover and I was like, oh my God. Books aren't cheap either. Yeah. I think that was around the same time that the movie Navy Seals with Charlie Sheen came out. So that's why I kind of knew about that because I actually knew about it a little bit before. And I went over this on Mike Ritland's podcast when I was on there, but the Popular Mechanics magazine Mm -hmm. had an article on Navy Seals and that's where I first found out that that was even a thing. Yep. Um, and that was in grade school. I think I picked that up at the library and was like, oh, my God, i got to keep <laughs> Look this. Look at all this cool stuff. I may or may not have not turned that back into the oh. library. <laughs> the late fees are anyway. astronomical. <laughs> you owe them $30,000 in this fees. School, the school library is not the same. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, that's kind of what got me started. So, you know, to get back on the topic of whether or not people should write books, I mean, that's – that's really where I got a lot of my first knowledge of, of yeah. that kind of stuff. And it really pushed me into wanting to go, too. Which, believe it or not, that Army-Navy store that I went to in Virginia Beach was LBT. London, Whoa. London Bridge Trading. Really? Yeah. yeah. That's cool. Kind of neat, huh? Hmm. Back in the day. I was wondering what kind of Army-Navy store would have a copy right. of. Right, right. And you yeah. know what's funny about that, too, is I remember distinctly coming back home. Because 
I was really hesitant with the whole military interest. Mm-hmm. I mean, my dad was in the army, but my mom was just this staunch, like, you'll never <laughs> go, you're never going to go in the military. Promise me. And I'm like, yeah, I'm uh-huh, sure. <laughs> promise. Uh, Where do I sign? <laughs> famous last words. Yeah. And then I remember coming home and, you know, I kind of had to like hide it a little bit. So I remember calling the number on the receipt because I had bought something small there, like a mm-hmm. patch or something like that. And I remember calling the number on the receipt and like, do you still have that book? And uh, can I buy that? And I remember them going, well, sure, but you could probably go to the bookstore and get it. And I There's was like, probably I was a like, bookstore oh, closer. Yeah, yeah that's, that's good. <laughs> that's, that's clutch. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. I'll be on my way. My 12 year old brain didn't really put that together, but anyway, <laughs> it was pretty funny. That's great. But, uh, yeah, that's what first got me interested. And so say what you will about people writing books, but you never know how they're going to affect people that may pick it up and, yeah, you know, so there's that aspect. Well, of, and I'm, that. I'm so like, I have this thing with books to where I'll read like four books at the same time. I kind of rotate just I based off too. of interest. Yep. So I'm also reading a book called Touching the Dragon, which was about a former SEAL and he's writing it almost kind of like a, as a part of therapy because that was one of the things when they came back. Um, so it's about the guy that was involved in the mission to save Bo Bergdahl. Oh, and he yeah. got shot through the leg. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he talks about the depression that he felt after getting shot and like how his his team needed him and he wasn't there. And so one of the things that his therapist recommended is like, hey, why don't you start writing some of this stuff down? Mm-hmm. Because it can help you as an outlet. And so this book is kind of like his outlet. So, you know, a lot of people say, oh, you shouldn't write books. Well, sometimes it helps people. Yeah, so I agree. It's not always a bad thing. But I agree with that, too. Now, I mean, obviously, there's a fine line between what should be in books and what shouldn't. Yeah. And, you know, that type of review process for the Pentagon, like, is put in place for a reason because mm-hmm. they can literally, which happened in No Easy Day, they can literally come after you and say, hey, yep. by the way, every dime you've made off this book is going to us. I did <laughs> yeah. feel like a little kid reading that book, though, knowing that the Pentagon hadn't reviewed it because I was like, <laughs> oh, we're into secret stuff now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, kind of ridiculous. Yeah. Well, that's what happened with uh, Rogue Warrior, too. So that was So not, he just pushed it out? Yeah. Nice. Yeah, so he, he got... punk rock. Yeah, he got... <laughs> punk rock that's funny um anyway that uh so it's kind of funny too is as the years have gone by and i've really kind of purposely not picked up books like that i Mm -hmm. think the last book that i really read um full meaning like bought it from from the store and i've been sent books before that i've read Mm -hmm. and it's i just don't put those in the same category like it's almost i want to read them to review on its or Mm -hmm. you know gain more knowledge on but the actual, the last military book I think I bought was No Easy Day. And it, mm. and it wasn't something I really even wanted to buy, but I kept hearing from people, it's yeah. such a great book. And I'm like, uh, mm. yeah. <laughs> okay, fine. Yeah, but um, I think before that it was Luttrell's book, and that was the last one yep. I'd read before then. And No Easy Day is the last one I've really read like that. So yeah. I don't know. I just I feel like as time goes by, I've just my interest has waned in those kind of books. And mm-hmm. I've, I've started to come back to more classic stuff, in literature mm-hmm. um, and reading that, um, even though it's still fiction, yeah. um, I still kind of dig that because I feel like for me, it's it's a little bit of an escape from what I deal with on a daily basis. It's different. Yep. Um, and it's also kind of historical in a sense too, because classics are classics for a reason. Right. You know, and they carry Timeless. a lot of weight. Yeah. So like right now I'm reading big old thick Bram Stoker's Dracula book. Nice. Um, yeah. So I've actually been starting to get into collecting better looking books because I want to like, you know, have a nice bookshelf. But you're so actually actually reading them? Yeah. Oh yeah. man. Uh, nice cool. leather bound books. Yeah. But yeah. My cabinet smell of rich mahogany. I was gonna say do you have rich mahogany <laughs> shelves for them. No, but the so this one's really cool. It's a leather bound copy of it. And when I say leather bound, it's probably like a genuine leather. It's <laughs> leather not like bound. A, yeah, <laughs> right. It's not like a super expensive book or anything. Yeah. But it really looks cool. So like the spine looks all neat and it's red for oh, Dracula cool. and it's got it's really artistically done well for mm-hmm. the the graphical a- aspect of the book which is what drew me to it um, plus I just wanted to read Dracula and I've, I've read it before but oh, okay I sense of how tough of a away. read is it I mean language wise language wise it's fine okay. that's not really the concern but there's a there's a large a huge section of it where you're reading diary transcripts of, okay. of the <laughs> I, I says I think it's the girlfriend or the mm-hmm. wife of the the person who Dracula is trying to take under his wing and gotcha. you know control so that's that part's a little difficult to get through but 
that's kind of where I am right now. So I keep picking it up and putting it down for that reason. Yeah. But, uh, so I'm also, I'm also trying to get back into reading comic books a little bit too. Yep. Um, I've been, I bought the first eight issues of Mr. Miracle. That's the new Mitch Gerards and Tom, okay. Tom King thing. So they did Sheriff of Babylon. Before that, Mitch did Punisher. Before that, um, you know, Mitch and Nathan Edmondson worked on the activity. So I've been mm-hmm. kind of following that that path that Mitch has taken with. That's kind of cool to follow yeah. an artist. Yeah, it's been cool. Um, so, and also, you know, Mitch did some stuff with us too for a while. Um, we were in like the activity and the ads and stuff like that. Like he drew a custom ad for us in that, which was pretty neat. So cool. Yeah. Which we have framed somewhere. Of course. Yeah, here. it's, it's yeah. floating. The Punisher one with our stuff in it's right there too. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. So that I, I've been trying to keep back up with that and I'm, I go on brief hiatuses from comic books a lot, so I'll read a lot and then I'll put them down and mm-hmm. come back to them later. Um, and then I'm still reading through those hard, was it hard crime, hard case crime books. Nice. So I started at the beginning of those, and I've just been kind of slowly. And those are like reading like them. detective type stories. Yeah, they're or? like little uh, pulp kind oh, of okay, novels. Cool. So they're nice. like. They call them hard case crime or hard boiled detective. The classic, novels. like I was yeah. waiting at my desk with <laughs> yeah. the light on. You know, yeah, they're kind of neat stories, yeah. and that's cool. Again, I kind of have been reading more for, you know, before bed escape kind of reading. So yep. I've been kind of focusing on that too. And then I, you know, I've wanted to get into historical stuff more too, like mm-hmm. nonfiction, but I just haven't. I haven't really picked up much. I think the last thing that I was reading from that, I think I read a Ben Franklin piece like a autobiography or biography type thing so hmm. I'm trying to think of what else i've been i do a lot of uh coffee table books <laughs> i feel ridiculous yeah. when i'm reading them because they're so <laughs> huge but yeah i'll, I'll flip through coffee table books i have a those are the ones that catch those are the those are the bla- uh bookstore traps for me yeah i'll oh, pass yeah. a coffee table i'm like oh, oh you can't cool, not huh? pick them up it's like yeah. matt with a koozie yeah <laughs> like, i have um like aaron draplin's book on design I like that. Mm-hmm. There's lots of pictures. <laughs> it keeps me interested. But yeah, I do those. And then um, I just, like a couple months ago, I read back through John Hurt's book, mm-hmm. com- yeah. like a Combat Tracker's Guide or that's Guide actually, to Combat Tracker. That's yeah. actually so cool. And I said that about you know military type books, but that's one that I've been still going through. Yeah, as that well. to me is like a textbook, yeah. which is really cool. And it's just not that I ever plan on doing that. It's just really cool to see the information and think about it as mm-hmm. a, almost like a mental exercise. Yep. So that's always kind of cool to see. Yeah. And so, I mean, aside from what we're reading, um, it, if we can kind of break down the books that we probably have on that list and things that we recommend, um, if I were to start at the very top of my list of what I would tell somebody that said, hey, can you recommend some books? I would start with Gavin De Becker's Gift of Fear, yep. and then it would be um, Stephen Pressfield, Gates of Fire. I was going uh, to say that first, but yeah, I've thought about yeah, it's Fear tough. Here. It's yeah. tough because I think I think Gift of Fear is more practical, sure, and Gates of Fire yeah. is more esoteric. I guess it's yeah. it's it really kind of gets at the psychology of yeah. Battle. If you've ever felt like yeah. you can't do, yeah, read Gates exactly. of Fire because you can do. Yeah, and that severely motivated me you know, in the Navy too. Oh, so like I picked that up why I was or like right before I went to bus because it was recommended to me by um, a team guy friend of Nick's that said, Hey, you guys need to read this. And man, during a school, I, I flew through that Pour and then it. I kept yeah. reading it back and forth yep. and wound up eventually writing quotes from the book underneath my hat. I wore during hell week and shit like that. That's so, awesome. Yeah, it was pretty cool. But uh, yeah, I would say those are my top two recommendations. How about you? Yeah, I mean, especially when you get into, like, motivation and stuff like that. But also, like, uh, I mean, we've talked ad nauseum about uh, getting things done. Yes. But I... That would, I, I think that, that would be number three. Yeah, I probably me. read that once a year at least. Yeah. Just to get back to it. Because, I mean, the biggest thing with getting things done is that people always put on, I think, a little bit of a front of, like, oh, I, I always do GTD. And they're like, no, I fall off constantly. <laughs> and... So, you know, there's always like a a, roller coaster. Yeah. Just this mess of stuff I need to get to and process. And so listening to getting things done helps me kind of recenter and like, okay, now I'm getting back into it because I think one of the powerful things about getting things done is how in control it makes you feel. And so you can just keep rinsing and repeating that step. Um, I definitely agree with that. But yeah, I mean, Gates of Fire is super motivational. There's also um, the power of habit. 
by mm-hmm. this guy named Charles Duhigg is really cool because he breaks down a lot of different anecdotes about how big companies or um, certain people or research scientists use habits and how habits form and the chemicals behind them and things like that. So mm-hmm. it helps to kind of, I don't know, ground you in like, yeah, it turns out lots of people have crappy habits. Yeah. You just got to attack it from head on. Yeah, and you know, kind of continuing on my list would be Wired to Eat by Rob Wolf. Yep, That's a huge. That was a huge one for me personally, which, funny enough, it's literally a week away from the year that Kelly and I started nice. eating that way. So, I mean, I'm down, I think my heaviest was like 194-ish, and 95, and then I'm down to like 168. That's so, awesome. Which is crazy. Like yeah. I've, I don't even remember myself weighing under one seventy. So yeah, yeah, pretty cool. Like even, even when I was working out all the time before I went to Buds, I, I remember being like one seventy two, one seventy three, mm-hmm. somewhere in there. Maybe even one seventy five. But yeah, just kind of nuts. It's it's powerful information, and you know, not a uh, like a temporary thing. Yeah, it's like a, you just change this because not because that you you feel like you want to change something about you. It's just like, he makes such a great argument for like, no, it's just some of the food that we eat is just crappy and hurts you. So like, just avoid it and it gets better. And really the way he explained it with inflammation and how inflammation is caused in your body and how it leads to other things like disease and Mm -hmm. cancer and things like that. It just made me go, well, yeah, of course. And it just, I don't know. It made a lot of sense to me. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I took it personally as a challenge to start eating better like that. And, um, you know, it was, it was weird, the, the, the progression Kelly and I made, cause that's really what I think made it stick is that we both decided to do it. Yeah. And I think if it would have been me or her or whatever, I don't think it would have yeah. come out the same way, but, um, we just really kind of went cold Turkey, which was crazy and really it didn't, didn't look back. <laughs> yeah. Oh, of course <laughs> the sugar, the getting off sugar was the worst part. Yeah. That was the worst thing. It took probably week and a half or so maybe mm-hmm. two weeks yeah i always do, like two weeks is a good yeah just prepare to have a, a crappy time for two weeks yeah and you know i actually wasn't as miserable as i thought i was going to be during that time but yeah. yeah it still was tough to get through but yeah i mean it's amazing though the power that sugar has and carbs really mm-hmm. have over what we do and our cravings and things like that because my actual craving for that was like one of the biggest realizations I had for from that was the cravings I had for food went away. Yeah, you know, and that was that was the that was pretty powerful. Well, and to me, also how much sweeter other things get. Yes, you know, like I I, I used to not like berries. Like I'd eat some some blackberries or something, and be like, oh, okay, it's okay. But you don't eat carbs for a while, and you eat a blackberry. You're like, mm-hmm. this is the sweetest thing I've ever had. Yeah, the uh, <laughs> I think the biggest thing for me was when. We didn't eat sugar for so long, and we started kind of eating like what is it, like eighty-eight percent dark chocolate. Oh yeah, and that even tastes sweet to me. That used which to, is crazy. I mean, that used to taste like sour. Like oh, oh something's wrong with your chocolate, yeah. man. Get that away from me. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So that's kind of interesting too. All those things, but yeah. So why are to eat? It's a great book. Um, and I really think that a lot of my recommendations come from the skill side because that's really what. That's what interests me the most when I get into books and mm-hmm. when I really enjoy them and recommend them to people. There's something powerful that I learn in them that applies to life. So yeah, that's, I mean, I think that's, that's a big portion of reading. Yeah, I like, there's some reading that you do, like you said, with fiction is right. to escape. Mm-hmm. But I use like my commute to work to listen to books that are going to better me. Not necessarily like I won't listen to mm-hmm. a fiction book, audiobook. I'll, I'll always have some sort of like. There's an end goal to this. Why am I reading yeah. this? Oh, it's to take someone's motivation and like, yeah, I'm going to take that to heart. Or well, that's what I that's what I do with business books. So mm-hmm. I read a lot of well, I listen to a lot of business books. Um, and I have reading an, and listening. Yeah, I have an audible. Yeah. I have an audible subscription for that, and that's what I do on my commute. I mean, it takes me a good twenty to twenty five minutes sometimes to get to work, and mm-hmm. I use that commute back and forth to knock out audio books and. Yep. Yeah, I've, I'm trying to think of, like, the best business book I've listened to in a long time. It's probably, it's probably Traction. That was, a, that was a book that both Kelly and I listened to that have, that's helped a lot mm-hmm. in our business. But, um, yeah, there's all kinds of great books like that, and we really need to go back and update that list. But Audible has a really great business category. Mm-hmm. If you go into the category, the top 
10 books or whatever. I, I haven't read all 10, but I've read six or seven of them. They're good. There's you know, a top the, 10 list in yeah, there? Yeah, it's like hmm. the how to win friends and influence people, all the standard By Carnegie. Yeah. yeah, and then Did there's Did you know the, he's not a real Carnegie? I don't I know who a real Carnegie is. So. The Carnegie family. Like I, the big, I, don't I, know. Couldn't, I couldn't pick them out of a lineup. I think so they I were robber. I think they called them robber barons or something oh. like that. Anyway. Um, the other one was like how I stopped learning to give a F. Oh. That's another good one. Yeah, it's like, like I mean, Mark it's not, Mason. Yeah, it's like not a business book so much, but a lot of business people had started recommending. Oh, the it. subtle art of not giving a yeah, yeah, that's the one. Yeah, I can't. I can never remember whether we're cussing on this show or not. We're not. No, not on this not. one. I think I already that's said that's the one. problem. We have two podcasts. <laughs> one we don't curse. The other inside if language, we don't curse, outside it's weird. language, right? It's weird. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, yeah, but that's yeah. A, that's a great book. Mark Mason's book mm-hmm. is phenomenal. I love that. I've also started. I mean, we we did that article on stoicism, mm-hmm. and yes. I subscribed to the Daily Stoic, and mm-hmm. I'm I'm trying really hard to read through like meditations. So it's I, difficult. I actually had a conversation with Kelly about this this morning with stoicism, and I'm at a crossroads kind of at one of their tenets. Mm-hmm. So it it comes down to like the poverty thing. So there's there's kind of a tenet of stoicism, and I'm going to bastardize this, but. Um, Essentially, what it comes down to is that everything you have in life could be gone tomorrow. So, meaning you could be you could be poor tomorrow and living on the street, and the things that you enjoy could be gone. So, it's better to try to live as though that could happen at any time. So, like you could leave life tomorrow is kind of the thing. So, yeah, <laughs> and that's used by a lot of people to to not buy nice things and to not enjoy money because it could be gone and they save it and they never use it and you know it's i don't know i'm conflicted with that because at the same time it's like okay so with success comes ability you know it gives you more resources you're able to do more things so with that do you take that success and that extra income do you invest it for the long term Mm -hmm. the smart way or do you do you spend some and actually enjoy it and take trips? You know, it's 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 that balance that that's a good point. It's conflicting in I my mean, that head, is you know? one of the tenets that I wouldn't say I disagree with it, but I definitely don't practice it because I I feel like because of the way that I think, especially when it comes to stoicism, if I did lose everything, it would be my reaction to that that would be the real mm-hmm. test of that, which is like okay, it's gone. Let's deal with it from here. So I don't think you have to practice that. It's like you don't have to prepare for a house fire by setting your house on fire. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, I mean, they bring up things in, like I know I've read before in those Daily Stoic emails and things like that and books I've read on Stoicism that, you know, people will practice being poor by, you know, dressing a certain way and going out in public and feeling the the feeling of that yeah. or, you know, practicing living poor for a month and not... You know, it's and I understand that I, I'm not faulting people for it. I yeah. just, however, I I don't know where I stand with that. I think know? a lot of that lacks the real motivation that comes from actually being poor. I, yeah, I've seen a lot of. There's a couple documentaries I've seen of like we're gonna live on minimum wage for a week. It's like okay, well that's fine, but it's only a week, and you know there's an end game. Right. It really comes down to when you're making minimum wage and you don't have an end game. That's what it really changes you. So it's. I don't know. I would rather focus on like helping. Yeah. And I also think, um, I guess my perspective is different and that's what I try to look at too, Mm -hmm. is that, you know, I didn't grow up poor, but I also didn't grow up with anything I wanted. So, you know, I kind of, I came through life not, you know, being able to do whatever I wanted. And, you know, I went to the military so I could earn money to go to college. That's one reason. That's a big, huge reason I went, Mm -hmm. um, which I did. And that's the reason I have a degree. It's not like my parents had a college fund for me. So, um, you know, I do think that a lot of what I have has been, you know, through the success we've found in, in Mm -hmm. building something. But at the same time, I, I take that with a grain of salt as well. And I just feel, I I understand the, the philosophy, but I also, I guess I feel that there's a a level of that mm-hmm. that I want to attain, yeah. but I don't want to be a hundred percent in on that. You know what I mean? Right. Like I don't want to be Seneca. Yeah. Like right. He had a lot of great thoughts and stuff, yeah. but at the same time, I'm like, okay, well, I mean, that's a little extreme. But mm-hmm. it's interesting to read those kind of things, and I try well, to work through it. Yeah, you definitely model behavior on things like that, sure. and it's. I feel it's important to kind of get perspective like that too, and. You know, stoicism is what I've related to the most out of mm-hmm. anything I've read like that 
philosophy wise. So well, you see like Ben Franklin's daily schedule, mm-hmm. and it like I I see it. And I'm like, man, that is a rigid schedule. But I think he can't have done that every day, <laughs> not every day. Like there was a Ben Franklin Sunday where he was like, nah, I'm just gonna sleep. Yeah. Well, so so I look at it this way. It's funny you bring that up. So I have kind of a daily schedule that I put Mm -hmm. together in Evernote. It's got check boxes and I run through it, but I don't run through it every day. Right. You know, it's like it's there as a guideline. And some days I will, some days I will feel the need to get in there and actually check things off to kind of focus myself. Yep. Um, But it's kind of a general guideline that I try to hold to. And am I perfect? Absolutely not. You know, I, I fall off that all the time. So I feel like someone got a hold of Ben Franklin's Evernote document and like made a copy of it. And if he saw that today, he'd be like, Oh no. Uh, Well, you know, sometimes Monday, Wednesday, (laughs) Friday. Yeah. I'm not crazy. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I'm, I don't know. I think that's a good probably list of the books. I think we gave you like 15 books to read. Yeah. So so that'll (laughs) should probably keep you busy. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if uh, we'll put a bunch of stuff in the episode intel, we'll make sure we have a list in there, and then we will write it down as an agenda item to start updating that page yeah. with some some new stuff too. Because I know it's been a while, and I feel guilty about that. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in. We will see you next week. Make sure you send any questions via the pound tag Gear Tasting on any social media network. We'll find them and get them answered here on the show or our other show questions over coffee. Um, and as always, you know, if you're heading into iTunes to listen to the podcast, we would very much appreciate you leaving a five-star review and a little quirky, funny comment because we're enjoying those. Um, hopefully you think that we deserve a five-star rating and it will help the show to get our show seen by other people and Apple will reward the show by showing it to more people if we have a better rating. So very much appreciated on that. Um, and as always, check out the details of our crew leader membership in the episode Intel too. So we have some benefits that we can give you in return for your support um, on a yearly basis. Yeah. So thanks again. See you next week.